This is our first lesson in AP Stats, uh, Chapter 4, Lesson 1. We're looking at designing studies. Um, the key thing to a study is uh, we have a population of interest. That's all the individuals we want to study. Um, the sample that we take is, are the individuals that we actually collect information from. And we have to find a way to do this reliably so that we can uh, find out information about the population. So in class, our population, uh, when we looked at the Federalist Papers, was the entire uh, paragraph that we read, the excerpt. The sample were the five words you chose, oh, and then we used table D to choose. So our goal is to um, develop reliable ways of determining a characteristic of the population by using the sample. Uh, since it's uh, too time consuming and costly to gather information about the entire population, we have to do it this way. We're first going to be talking about surveys, where we're just um, observing something that's going on without changing one of the variables. Uh, for a survey, you always want to state which population you want to investigate first, uh, state what you want to measure, and then decide how to choose a sample from the population. We always want to avoid uh, convenient samples, which is just taking whatever is the easiest group of individuals from the population, um, and voluntary response samples. Voluntary response samples being um, people who respond on their own will, and that leaves room for people to not respond. So both of those lead to bias, which will skew our results and prevents us from inferring anything from, uh, from our sample. So what we'd like to do is avoid both, both of those. Um, when asked if a study does lead to bias, you want to always include the direction of the bias. Is it going to overestimate uh, the percentage or is it going to underestimate the percentage? So when choosing words in the Federalist paper, uh, we tended to overestimate. And that might have been because some of the bigger words have a better chance of getting chosen because they're more visible on the page. Who knows? So let's talk about ways that we can generate a simple random sample. The easiest way being placing names in a hat and drawing the sample without looking. Uh, that's always a good one to use when responding to a question because it's simple and you don't get caught up in details. Place names in a hat, shuffle them up, and draw without looking. We can also use a random in integer generator on our calculators, which you'd find under math, uh, the probability function, uh, and then number five, random integer. Um, the first number would be the lower bound, and the second number you put in after the comma would be the upper bound. Um, there's a third way. Um, there are websites that are, have random number generators. You can find one at the website here uh, once you click on applets, I believe. The third way that we can do this is we can use a random line from table D, like we did in class for the Federalist Papers. It's a little bit more time consuming, but you need to know how to do it that way as well. It will appear on some of our assessments and on the AP test. Um, problems that you could run into with an SRS is it's difficult to obtain an accurate list of an entire population if it gets large. Um, you have to also assign numbers to this large population, so that becomes problematic. Uh, different surveys will also uh, require either using replacement, which means once an individual is chosen for a sample, the individual goes back into the pool and can be chosen again, or without replacement, uh, which means once an individual is chosen once, you would skip that number if chosen again. In the case um, when we want to know average word length, we only wanted to pick a word out once, so we did it without replacement. And that will be the most common way to, to sample, without replacement. Strategies for choosing an SRS are very important. Um, the first would be a stratified random sample, where we break the population into uh, groups based on a characteristic that we call a strata. And then we take an SRS of the same size from each of those groups. So we find a characteristic that we think uh, could be affecting our results, separate it, and then when we take an SRS from each of those groups, we can see if that is actually uh, affecting what's being measured. You always have to choose the strata or characteristic that you would be um, separating the groups based upon before you would uh, do any of your work and take your SRS. Um, and based on facts that you know before the sample is taken. So if you're a radio station, you might break up the population into geographical regions. So where somebody lives would be the strata. And then you would take an SRS from each region, since maybe where somebody lives is likely to affect um, what, they, what type of music they like. Another type of sample is a cluster sample. 
uh, where we divide the population into smaller groups in which each group mirrors the characteristics of the population. So that means that one group would have a, per a percentage of each characteristic that was that represents the amount present in the population. So we would then choose an SRS of the clusters, meaning you would choose a group and you would survey everybody in that group. Um, so every individual in the group is included in the sample. Um, an example here would be an example would be if administrators wanted feedback from seniors on the use of Schoology and decided to use homerooms as clusters uh, with the idea that each homeroom uh, mirrors the characteristics of the entire senior class. So then they would do an SRS, uh, choose five homerooms, and everybody in the homeroom is included in the survey. Now an advantage here is that that's convenient because you choose a group, survey everybody in the group. So that can make it easier to facilitate a study. So samples that would lead us to not have, um, not be representative of the population include convenience samples, or you're just, uh, you're just taking a group based on whatever is easiest or most convenient, or voluntary response samples, where somebody has to respond in order to get uh, the data from them, um, which could lead to people um, that are only passionate about the subject responding and others not. So that would um, make our data would take away from it being representative of the population. Now even if we were to conduct a study and that removed all bias and had a flawless design, we're still unlikely to get a, an outcome that is exactly um, like the population. Just because of chance variation, it's unlikely that our survey is going to have the exact results. So since it could be a bit off, we develop a margin of error, meaning an interval that we're confident that the population's parameter appears in, that the characteristic from the population appears in. So we could say we think that 70% of seniors like Schoology, but our margin of error is 5%, meaning um, we could be off by 5%. So we're confident that it's somewhere between 65 to 75%. In order to have more accurate results with our sample, we would always like a larger sample size because then chance variation is less likely uh, to prevent us from getting an accurate answer. So the larger uh, sample we take, the less likely we are to have to happen to get two two-letter words in our sample. We only took five words when we did it in class uh, for just because of time constraints. However, that could mean you chose four two-letter words and one three-letter word, which could happen by chance, but doesn't give us a good indication of the average word size within those um, Federalist papers we looked at. Uh, same thing, you could be skewed in the other direction. You could have randomly selected all big words. So larger sample size and multiple samples can help us with that. Other problems with surveys that come up are um, under coverage. So some groups may be left out of the process in choosing a sample. Um, if a group in the population isn't as large as another, they're less likely to be chosen, so perhaps they're not included in it, especially if your sample size is smaller. Uh, and non-response, meaning an individual uh, chosen can't be contacted. Uh, perhaps they're not passionate about the issue, maybe they just don't check their email or check phone calls depending on how you're contacting them. Finally, uh, the last problem we have is response bias. When the wording of a question creates bias, maybe it's worded in a way uh, that leads you to an answer and then you're not really getting somebody's opinion you're more causing them to tell you what that opinion is so response bias is going to be the focus of our upcoming project where you're going to word a question um, in multiple ways to see if you can word it objectively and then and then subjectively meaning you can word the question in a way that leads people to be more likely to one of the two answers that you have um, so keep all these things in mind. Uh, a simple random sample is one of the fundamental ideas that we'll be talking about all year, and it's key to all of statistics. So keep in mind the different types of samples. Um, stratified random sample, where you break up the population based on some common characteristic. A cluster sample, where each group should mirror the characteristics of the population. 
Uh, and keep in mind the problems we have. There is no perfect study. So we'll be looking at studies and always trying to find where their bias may be. And even if it is designed very well, um, how chance variation could affect the outcome.